Good morning, church. Welcome this morning. Let's, uh, let's begin um, this service with some worship, praise and worship. If you would stand to your feet, if you're willing and able. Let's sing together. A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never fails. Our helper, He amid the flood. A mortal is prevailed. For still our ancient fall doth seek to work us well. His craft and power great, and armed with cruel And on earth is not his Fortress is 
give the Lord praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus, that you are a mighty fortress. It's good to see you all, church, this morning, whether you're in person or online. And at this moment, you can have a seat. Well, good morning, Hillside. Thank you for joining us here this morning. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, I'm Andrew. I am an elder apprentice here at Hillside. Uh, I'm excited to be here. I hope you are, too. It's going to be a great Sunday. So I want to welcome you all. The, a joyful greeting this morning is found in Psalm chapter 118. It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast, his steadfast love endures forever. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So having received the Lord's greeting, while we rise and just greet each other, say good morning. <laughs> all right let us pray heavenly father we thank you for this new day and for your new mercies that come every single day we thank you that you have a good plan and a purpose for each one of us uh, father god help us to surrender all the things that cause us anxiety and fear and to trust them to your care don't let us forget this truth that everything is possible with god and help us carry the joy of your presence throughout our day and to actively dispense it to people that we encounter in it. Amen. You may be seated. Psalm reading this morning from Psalm chapter 31, verses 1 through 5 and then 15 through 16. It says, In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. And for your name's sake, you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net they have hidden from me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hands of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. All right, if you would stand again, church, and let's sing together. Doing some cardio this morning, standing, sitting. Let's lift our voices and sing together. Remember those walls that we call sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died. Heroes, those walls are up and down. Remember those giants we call death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way, but he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. This is our God. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. That fear that took our breath away Faith so weak that we could barely pray But he heard every word, every whisper Yes, he did Now those altars in the wilderness Tell the story of his faithfulness He does, He saves us, He bore the cross. 
sin, nobody but Jesus. And who pulled me out of that pit? He did, he did. And who paid for all of our sin? Nobody but Jesus. And who rescued me from that grave? service with all the proceeds going to fund that event which is great because you have two choices one you can just come to church next Sunday and purchase some delicious baked goods or do what I'm going to do and provide the baked goods did somebody say let's make some cupcakes now I usually don't reveal my recipes but to make something special for the very picky people of Hillside I need to make sure it meets everybody's dietary needs. So first I start with a cup of gluten-free bisquick, some red jello because for the kids, and then you have to add an avocado because people say that this is good for you. I don't know why. Okay. Then for the vitamin people, throw in some vitamin D, some echinacea, okay? And then very important that you take, because it's a bit dry, a handful of these Norwegian salmon oil pills. Don't ask me why, but those Norwegians, they have some really healthy skin. And then of course, really, why I ask, Hershey's chocolate syrup, of course. But then I have one more secret ingredient. <laughs> I throw in a few of my anti-hypertension pills into the mix, because who can't use less tension in their lives? Oh, all I have to do now is cook these babies up and bring them to next Sunday's Rise Against Hunger Bake Sale, where I will see you with your own baked goods or with your wallet open. Make plans for Sunday, May 21st for our annual business meeting at 12.30 after the service. But before you go, oh, a business meeting, so boring. I'd rather poke my eyes out with a rusty spoon. Lunch will be provided. And Chairman of the Congregation, Scott Dunsmore, will be telling funny anecdotes between the ministry reports and the updates for the coming year. But seriously, all are welcome and encouraged to attend because the Hillside Church Annual Business Meeting is... is... lunch will be provided. <laughs> coming up in the month of May, on Monday, May 15th, Ryan Nielsen will present the results of the church-wide survey. Then Tuesday, May 16th, Hillside 3D will meet with the ministry focus being Bloom. The CEO and several residents are going to be in attendance. Sunday, May 21st is going to be special because it will be the children and youth church service. Kids choir performing the Messiah or something a lot shorter. On Wednesday, May 31, Renew will be having their garden party. There's a lot going on in May. Make plans now. It is Confirmation Sunday. So after the service, please stop by the Welcome Center, see what you can sign up for, and say congratulations to the confirmants. I would, but I gotta get cracking on my recipe. Hey, someone passed me the Vegan Vitamins. I'm gonna add them to the recipe too. 
All right, at this point, we have our scripture reading. Um, Sandeep, if you'd come up. Good morning, everyone. Today's scripture reading is from Acts chapter 7, verses 55 through 60. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were storming Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. So ends the reading. Let's continue to worship in song this morning. If you're willing and able again, please stand and join us. So Christ is my firm foundation. Christ is my firm foundation. Stick 
declare that together. Who am I that you say? 
And the sprouts can stay around for a little while if they want to, or they can leave, it's up to them, but we're gonna do something with younger kids, so whatever your parents wanna do. You can dismiss them now or let them sit through the confirmation time. That'll only be a few minutes. Uh, hi, my name is Pastor Bob Lawson. For those that I haven't met yet, I'm looking forward to meeting you sometime. Uh, today is a special day. It's a completion of three years of study, right? Three years? That's a long time. And uh, notice that it's called confirmation and not graduation. You guys are graduating up into um, Christendom. Christendom. It, you've completed a course of study. Now, our sincere hope as a church is that you come into a conscious knowledge of faith, a mature, conscious knowledge of faith. And you got all the material here you needed. How many of you have been through confirmation? Just by a show of hands. Okay, not everybody. So maybe we should have an adult confirmation. Would you like that? We could do a, a, a shorter version, though. <laughs> um, anyway, these are the things they learned. And there was really five different things that they learned during the course of three years. They learned the Ten Commandments, which you could recite for me right now if I asked you. They, I'm not going to ask you. <laughs> the three articles of the Creed, um, the Lord's Prayer, and there's uh, seven petitions in that, and then the two sacraments, the sacrament of baptism and the sacrament of um, the Lord's Supper. When I say that they're not quite done, I mean that, because when you were baptized, you were too small, I'm guessing. Were you both babies when you were baptized? Remember all of that? No. But when, you guys remember, right? Every time we have a baptism, these words are spoken. And maybe you didn't realize it, but the church is the sponsor of the baptized children, or, or they're older. The church sponsors them. Sometimes parents want someone else to sit in too, like they call them godparents. The church are these kids' godparents. And here's the question that's asked of the sponsors. Will you all pray for these children that are not children anymore, Avery and Andrea, young adults, will you continue to pray for them and use your influence to guide them in knowing Christ better? And will you seek God's guidance and strength to live your lives as good examples for, for them? Um, I don't know if Tammy is here hiding somewhere. Tammy gave a talk at, at, our, um, at our HARP program, which is um, hillside old people. I don't remember what that says. <laughs> Association of Retired People, hard. <laughs> I'm one of them, it's okay. <laughs> but she talked, Tammy talked, and she talked about her mom, and she mentioned that um, she had learned something with her brother Aaron about how kids come to know, come to be part of a church. And she says it's a five-to-one process. So, right, there's um, one leader and five children, right? Mm, no, the other way around. It's five adults talking into one child's life. That's why we have such a robust youth program here. There's a lot of people that are talking into these lives. It wasn't just the three years you spent in confirmation. It was the, the other times that you spent here in youth group and when you came through Hills Like Kids. So, right? So we've been talking into their lives. And you can do that too. Heart people or anybody. Uh, they need, the kids in this congregation need to know that they're part of this church. You should learn their names. Talk with them. Say hello. Figure out their names. Kids love to hear their names. That's going to be a problem for me, but I'll work on it. I don't even remember most of your names yet. <laughs> but my point is really baptism, confirmation, these are parts of their lives. But the truth is they, they need to grow into that mature faith. Maybe they're already there. I'd love to hear some of their testimony, some of their story, but um, maybe not yet. And this isn't graduation, so you've got ways to go yet. All right. So without further ado, I'm going to ask you two to come up, and we're going to have a couple of questions and answers. Oh, no, just one question and one answer. Why don't you stand over here, Avery? And you can stand there, Andrea. Ah, oh, lost the mic. Here we go. You're not nervous, right? Nah, not a little bit. So I'm going to sit here, out of the way, and here we go. 
these are questions that they learned in that red book that Martin Luther wrote called The Catechism all those many years ago. Um, Avery, I'll start with you. Can you be saved through keeping the law? No, I cannot be saved through keeping the law because since the fall, uh, no human beings have been able to keep God's law perfectly. And the text that we, we spoke about, or you, your teacher spoke about, Romans 3.23, what does that say? It says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yes, that's correct. Okay, very good. Let's hear it for Avery. Good job. No pressure, Andrea. Uh, the question I have for you is, how has Christ redeemed you? Christ has redeemed me by paying for all my sins with his precious and holy blood and with his innocent sufferings and death and by fulfilling the law in my place with his perfect life and complete obedience. Yes. And 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, proof text. It says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that redeemed you from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Kevin Rubick. He can introduce himself, but the guys can stay there. The, uh, just tell them a little bit about who taught them, because it wasn't me. Okay. Yeah, so um, over the three years, uh, we have uh, the elders go over, um, we, we have a, the sixth grade, we start with a Bible overview program, uh, which gives them a platform, and then seventh grade and eighth grade, the elders and the pastor go over the Red Book, as Pastor Bob showed you. Um, so yes, it is a three-year process, and um, I, I encourage everyone, you know, younger children, to uh, uh, enroll their children as they become uh, in those grades, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, because um, it will give you a firm foundation in your faith. And uh, it's something that um, we here at Hillside take very seriously, and uh, yes, we welcome them uh, into the next chapter of their lives. Um, and, and just a, an acknowledgement uh, for them, we have a gift bag for them, um, and this gift bag that we give them is not just uh, an ordinary gift bag. It's a study Bible, and it has their name engraved on it. Uh, we have a wall cross that they can place uh, as a decorative uh, item in their room or wherever, and we also have a book for them to read. So again, this is a, a process, and this is uh, something that um, we hope will carry them through the rest of their, their lives. Um, why don't we just take a minute to pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for these uh, children, for these young adults that have uh, been confirmed today. We think of uh, Andrea and Avery, and we just ask, Lord, that you would bless them in their lives. And coming up, uh, Lord, we ask that uh, these gifts that we give them, their Bible, and, and uh, that they would use it regularly, daily, that they would uh, seek you and that they would find... Uh, help and faith in you in their coming lives as they uh, grow and mature in their faith. So be with them, be with their families as they celebrate today, uh, this next chapter of their lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Sorry, just got transition. If there's any sprouts around, go, go. <laughs> Look at the flower I have at the Welcome Center. That's that flower we planted at Christmas. Oh, no, not Christmas. What was it? Easter. I slipped an extra book into your bag this morning that Kevin doesn't even know about. But I've been um, reading a book and sharing it with many people. I just ordered um, a bunch more copies and some on the welcome table back here if anybody's interested. It's called, if, if nobody's perfect, how good is good enough? How does the world figure out if they're, if they're gonna be a good person and get to heaven, that's the, that's the goal, that's what most people think. Well, how do you know? How do you measure that? Why wouldn't God make that clear? Well, I'm here to, to preach today to you that God has made that clear. And we're gonna look at chapter 14 
and the Gospel of John. So if you have your Bibles, you can put, pick those up, and we'll begin there. We're just going to do, really, the first 11 verses. Let not your hearts be troubled. Oh, what words of comfort for those who have lost loved ones, huh? We use this at so many funerals. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it, is not, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. And you know the, play, the way to where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That's enough for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still not, not, do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but with the Father who dwells in me and does his works. Believe in me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Here ends the reading. I, was, um, I once led a small group, and we studied a book that, by James Dobson. This was back in the 1990s. Yep, I'm old. <laughs> I'm definitely a heart member. Uh, the book was called Children at Risk, and it was subtitled The Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Our Kids. Anybody ever heard of that? Dobson's read a lot of parenting books. That's one of his older ones. That was in 1990, 33 years ago. And I stand before you, and I think that maybe we lost that battle. Still losing that battle for the hearts and minds of our kids. As a nation, I think we've lost that battle. And even sometimes as a church. Those kids from the 90s, that's some of you. <laughs> You're the parents. And statistics for that age group kind of, kind of prove my point about the battle. According to the Pew Research Center poll just from two years ago, 2021, it's a buy-in every two years. They'll do another one this year. Three in 10 U.S. adults are religious nuns. And that means people who describe themselves as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular. That stat has doubled since 1999. U.S. adults who identify as Protestants have dropped over 10 percentage points in the last decade, from 52% to 40%. And Catholics have held steady at 21%. Four in 10 adults have no religious affiliation. So when you go out into the workplace, you go out into wherever you spend your time, golf course, wherever, four out of 10 people you run into have no religious affiliation of any kind. They say that we're the fourth largest mission field in the world now, the United States. Just sobering thoughts. You see, you can't invite these people back to church I know there's a national back-to-church Sunday that many of you probably haven't heard about, but we did it at our church many, many years. You can't invite somebody back to something they've never been to. <laughs> so that has kind of pivoted, and now it's about inviting people to come to church, not just inviting them to come back. So you see how the thought has changed. Here's a key statistic for you. About 3 in 10 U.S. Christians, that's 31%, say that their religion is the one true faith leading to eternal life in heaven while nearly twice as many, 58%, say that there are multiple religions that can lead to heaven. Um, what do you think about that? There was a survey that we did here just a few, well, a month ago now, I think it is, from the Lutheran Brethren Church Survey, Hillcrest Lutheran Brethren. Um, we had Ryan Nilsson come in and give us that assessment and did some focus groups with many of you attended that. We had over 92 people participate. So we're getting the results for that, that back on the 15th of May on a Monday evening at 7 o'clock. So write that in your calendar to hear some about it. But I'm going to give you just one statistic that kind of threw me for a loop. Here, and this is actually a really good one. Here, listen. The only way to heaven is just like that other question, is through a personal relationship with Christ. 
79 strongly agreed, 14 agreed, dis strongly agreed, 14 agreed, seven were undecided or disagree. So that's 79%, way over the national average of 31, which is really good, right? Now there's a second question, not, maybe not so good. Question number 157, a good person of another faith other than Christianity may go to heaven. Well, 42% of us strongly disagree with that statement. 23 just disagree. And then the undecideds and the agree, 10% undecided, 14% agree. 65 disagree, but surprisingly, 35% agree with that statement. A good person of another faith other than Christianity may go to heaven. And what did Jesus have to come for? Why do we need him? He said he's the way to heaven. That doesn't roll off so well with the culture. People get offended by that, right? They both can't be true statements. The only way to heaven is through a personal relationship with Christ or a good person of another faith other than Christianity may go to heaven. So it can't be only one way, but yes, okay, the other way. It seems there's some compromise happening between the Christian worldview and the secular worldview. And that has only been getting much more severe since 1990 when uh, James Dobson wrote that book, Children at Risk, A Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Our Children. Jesus said it very plain. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So only two things are true here. Either Jesus is a liar, right? Or the Bible is false. Or maybe I missed something. Anyways, let's dig into it a little bit. I think it's the same old temptation. What happened in the Garden of Eden? What was the temptation that Satan used on, that, on, on good old Eve and, and, and Adam? Did God really say to put doubt in a person's mind. And now look what's happened in our own culture. People doubt all kinds of things about this book and about the Christian faith. Many of them haven't been, haven't really given it a whole lot of thought. I mean, you guys gave it a whole lot of thought in the last three years, right, guys? They had, they, they had to dig into it and learn about it and study it. Um, I don't think everyone has done that. Did God really say there's no other way? Yes, he did. Jesus didn't give them a formula for life. He didn't claim to know the way, the truth, and the life. He said he was the way. So let's, let's talk about it. He claimed to be the answer, the solution, the only way to eternal life. And that grates on our reason. Even, even maybe some of us sitting out here, grates on our reason or those listening. He's the only way? It doesn't seem fair. I mean, most people I run into, including people in my family, think if I'm a good person... I'll go to heaven. And not only that, but the majority of people think that we're basically good, which is not what the Scripture teaches. It says that we are, what did they say again? What did you say? All have what? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yeah. Um, but it goes on to say that Jesus came to rescue and redeem us. That's in, in Romans 3.23. All, all world religions teach their followers rules to follow, how to live a way that gives them a happy ending. And that makes perfect sense. That's reasonable. Show me the way. How good, though, is good enough? That's what that little book is about. I think you'll find that interesting, guys. How good is actually good enough if, if nobody's perfect? Wouldn't perfection be the only thing that's good enough? How do you know at the end if, you, if the scales are weighed in your favor or against you? That's what, that's what people in, in all other world religions come up against. When they come up against the end of their life, they worry. Did I do enough? Are the scales balanced? Will I get into heaven? When it's all said and done, we look at, when we look death in the eye, how can we be sure that we will get enough? People say this, I hope so. I tried my best to be good. It doesn't give us much assurance. Jesus actually came to clear up all that uncertainty. That's what John chapter 14 is about. So I want to dig into it a little bit. The context is, we're, we've moved back now. I know we, we were talking about post-resurrection stories in the last couple of weeks, but now we're moving back over to the Last Supper. John 14 is the, um, they, they've, in John chapter 13, they've, he, he washed the disciples' feet before dinner. Um, uh, Judas went out 
to betray him and, and left. And then um, Jesus gave them the new commandment, love your neighbors, love yourself. And then, and then he comes up against um, this, this talking, and he starts talking about he's going to go away. And, and they don't know what he's talking about. They got a little bit confused. We're going to pick it up in chapter 13 a little bit. Go back a bit, just a bit. Uh, when he had gone out, this is um, um, Judas. When, when he had gone out in chapter 13, 31, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. And then the next verse, first couple of verses are about that new commandment. But as soon as he said, where I go, you cannot come, Peter stopped listening. And if you jump down to verse 33, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? <laughs> what did you say? Where are you going? Back it up. And Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterwards, which didn't sit well with Peter at all. And Peter said, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And then we know the next verses, right? No, you're not going to lay down your life for me. Before the night is over, you'll deny me three times. And I'm sure that shocked everybody. And these weren't words they wanted to hear. So when we go to 14, it, he's continuing the conversation. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. So he's giving them comfort. He's telling them to um, rest their minds, put their minds at ease. Trust in me as you trust in God. Calmly he reassures them. He'll provide for them. He's going to go when he goes and prepare their way and welcome them home so they will all be together again. Still, they weren't ready to really understand that. As we age, those words become real important, that God goes to prepare a place for us. Because we get closer to the end. I think I saw a statistic that, um, yeah, let me think. Yeah, 100% of us will die. Pretty sure. 100%, unless the rapture comes, right? Disciples didn't quite get what he meant. And then Thomas hears, you know the, play, the way in which I am going? You read that? You, Jesus said, you know the way in which I am going. And Thomas, but little bold Thomas, he's, he's kind of a black and white kind of a guy. He raises his hand. He says, uh, you know the, I don't know where we're going. How can I know the way to go? Thomas didn't like riddles. So Jesus makes it as clear as he can to him. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Paul later on would, would express this, this, this concept as Jesus is the invisible image of God. And he doesn't just point the way. He says he is the way. He doesn't just teach them the truth. He says he is the truth. He doesn't just represent a way of life. He is the life. This is an exclusive claim that can be be compromised. But skeptics say, well, what? If, if God is real, why doesn't he just show himself? Take his finger and write across the sky. You ever heard that expression? God has done that. He has told us exactly. Philip says, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. Jesus had just told them that if they had known him, really known and understood them, then they would have known the Father too. From now on, you do know him and have seen him, verse 7. Philip doesn't, doesn't understand. Show us him. Show us him. Philip, how can you say, show us the Father? Haven't I been with you so long? You still don't get it? Verses 10 and 11, Jesus said this, I and the Father are one which is an astonishing claim that requires proof. Jesus is God's physical presence. He speaks and acts with the same authority. Believe what he says because he has backed that up, backed up that claim over and over again with works. He says, if you can't believe what I'm saying to you, believe by the works you've seen. These guys have been with him three years, kind of like you. Three years of training. That's what the apostles had gone through. And they've seen many miracles. How many miracles did you see in your class? Avery staying awake, that was a miracle. <laughs> sorry, parents, we're the parents, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. 
I wouldn't even know. I haven't been in her class. I, this is very odd for me to confirm a, a, a couple of students that I never even, I hardly know them. <laughs> but the truth is, I've heard really good reports, and I wish that Mr. Dunsmore could, could have been here this week because he would love to have, have been able to um, hand you those, those prizes and, and talk about you a little bit more. So John affirms again and again in his scriptures the basis of our faith are the eyewitness accounts that are written in scriptures. These guys had seen and touched and felt. And he, John, John put us this way in his, in his first letter, John, 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it, proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and made manifest to us. The objective historical reality of Christ is really not in question. But doubt persists. On the back table, you'll see some, I mentioned one misconception that people have about um, all religions get to heaven. There's, there's four others, and I'm not going to take the time to read them because time is flying away. But it's on our table in the back, at our welcome table if you're interested, right next to that book that says, um, How Good is Good Enough. Good reading. I think it's good things you should understand what people really think. What are these doubts? What's it doing to our culture? The Nicene Creed says it this way, and I think it's good. In 325, all the church, churches got together, and they formed a church, first church council, and the church council was so that all of these doubts could be cleared up, and they could write one creed that everybody could, could confess their faith to. And if you're going to be a member at this church, you need to confess to, one, to the creed. Usually we use the Apostles' Creed. On special Sundays, we use the Nicene Creed. Listen to the words of the Nicene Creed about Jesus Christ. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from light, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. And I told, we already talked a little bit about confirmation and what they had learned there. They learned that keeping the law can't save you. Another way of saying being a good person isn't going to get you to heaven. They learned how Christ has redeemed them by paying for their sins. The question that Andrew answered. I, I hope that these students and you will remember some of those lessons you hear at church when you come into contact with people that feel differently. Be prepared to um, not debate, but to, to, to give your point of view. We should be part of the discussion, not just sitting back and, and, and worrying that people will brand us, um, you know, some kind of a bias or what's the other words they use? They, they want to label us as being um, um, people that, that aren't inclusive, but yet God sent his son into the world to die for the world so that all the world may be saved through him. He didn't come to judge. He didn't come to select different groups. He came for all of us. And, and I don't know about you, but all those other religious people, they're all in their graves. <laughs> Jesus rose up out of the grave. He's the only one that did that. He was God. And, and, and the facts are there. Matter of fact, most world religions think very highly of Jesus. They don't, they don't put him down. They think his teaching is good. Well, how can they do that? Because they should really be calling him a liar or a lunatic because he said he was God. And they don't do that. They say, no, he is good. He's the only one I can think of that really is like that because he's different. He's God. He's told us who he was. A good person of a faith other than Christianity may go to heaven. If we, if we show them the way, yes. That's why, that's why we're here. We're not here just to get, listen to good music and feel good and go home and say, wow, that was, a great, that was great church worship today. We come here so we can learn how to engage with the 40% that are no part in church. That's why we're here. I mean, I'm glad you're coming, really. I'm, but we need, what we, this should be a place where we come and learn to go out. Amen? Anybody agree with that? <laughs> Just leave me up here all by myself. <laughs> I better stop because we're running out of time. And um, I know we have a few more things. We actually have... Um, Andrew, who, is, who stood up here a little while before and introduced himself to you, I hope you've met him already and you know who he is. He's one of the elder candidates. And um, in, unless something crazy happens between now and our annual meeting, Andrew will be, uh, where is Andrew hiding? Anyways, are you out here? Okay, come on up here. 
Um, I don't think it's time yet. Well, we got to do the collection first. I don't want to do that again. I did that last week. Um, let's just pray the Lord's Prayer together, would you? And then we'll have our collection time. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite the ushers and uh, the deacons to come forward as we collect your tithes. Uh, tithe is a percent of your income. I hope some of you do that. Um, and also your offerings and your gifts. Thank you. Savior.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for today. We thank you for bringing us to your house this morning, Lord. We thank you for all the blessings you've given us in our life, Lord. And uh, we know that you call us to uh, give back a portion of of our our gifts to you, Lord, for the furtherance of your kingdom, Lord. And we're happy to worship you in that way this morning, Lord. We ask that you take these gifts, use them uh, how you see fit, and to further your kingdom, uh, further hillside, and your kingdom as a whole. In your name we pray, amen. All right, so like Pastor Bob said, uh, my name is Andrew. I'm a candidate for elder here at Hillside. Uh, Pastor Bob seems to think we'll do okay. We'll see. Um, but part of that that calling is uh, for myself and Chris Monahan, the other candidate, to give our testimony in front of the church. So I'm going to talk about myself for a little bit. Uh, I've been coming to Hillside now for 15 years, 15, 16 years. Uh, I was born and raised in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And no, I'm not Amish. A lot of people ask me that. <laughs> um, I do know Amish, but I'm not, not Amish. I lived there. I, I lived there with my parents and three sisters. I was very blessed to be raised in a Christian home um, and attend church my entire life. Uh, I came to know Christ early on in my life. I believe I was about seven years old, uh, actually doing devotions with my dad one night before bed. And uh, so I've been a Christian mo- majority of my life, and it's been a blessing. Uh, I was actually homeschooled until high school. And then in 10th grade, my parents kicked me out. I went to public school with about 500 other people. So I went from a school of four, which was my sisters, to 500 kids. And uh, this is really the first time in my life where my faith started being questioned and challenged, you know, as, as will happen when you're in a, in a public environment like that. And uh, at the time, I knew the answers, but I didn't want to talk about it. Uh, so I kind of just shied away from it. It was part of me, but I, I didn't want to be have those discussions. Um, that followed me for a while through high school and into college. Uh, I went to college at Geneva College out by Pittsburgh. If anyone's familiar, I actually studied student ministry, um, which I'm using now a lot. Um, but in college, I had an awesome opportunity. Two to three other classmates and I met with one of our professors, who's also a pastor, um, every so often, about once a month to twice a month. And it was during that time where he asked me the same questions I was asked in high school, was able to help us figure out what that meant to us and really kind of make it personal and that's the time where I was able to to take everything I learned since I was a, a child a little kid and and how it applied to me and everything like that um, and then in college I also met Katie my wife who's in the back I won't make you come up because you're not going to <laughs> um, so we dated throughout college and then after college we moved out here because she's from here and she had her life together after college and I did not um, but she had a job. I didn't have a job yet, so we came here. She was born and raised in uh, Hillside here. For those of you not familiar, she's Katie Reby. She pulled in Nancy's daughter. Sometimes I start to explain that to people. Um, so we moved here, and Hillside's been great. You know, I started coming to Hillside really through the volleyball and the soccer that we did. Uh, Greg Barkey kind of led a little bit years and years ago in the NPR. Um, and Katie and I, like I said, we've been married for almost 15 years now. We have two children, Maddie and Luke, who are in the back somewhere. Um, we also have nine chickens, two dogs, and a cat. Um, so I'm also, something that's really pow- and powerful for me is I, I believe in the power of prayer. So if anyone wants to pray for me, my daily battle right now is convincing Katie and Maddie that we don't need any more pets. Uh, we have enough. So I know she wants to get bees next, everything else. Um, but in all seriousness, being married, or really in any relationship, it's shown me um, the importance of faith and prayer. You know, through marriage and those relationships, you have a lot of difficult times, a lot of difficult conversations, and uh, I've been able to see first and firsthand how just seeking God and, and prayer just helps us get more clarity about situations. Um, you know, I'm sure everyone else has done it, but I've tried to do a lot of things on my own. It often doesn't work out. Um, so like I said, in my life, I've, I've been faced with a lot of difficult situations. Uh, some of them, a lot, brought on by myself, and some that I can't control, but the power of prayer and seeking God and just knowing what he says for us has been uh, really impactful in my life. And uh, I'm excited for, for this opportunity. Um, and I just kind of want to close. One of my favorite verses I've really been growing through lately uh, in the past several years of my life, though, is from Deuteronomy chapter 31. Uh, in this passage, Moses is coming to the end of his life after leading, leading the Israelites, and he's commissioning Joshua to take over, um, leading the nation of Israel actually into the promised land at this point. And he says in verses 7 through 8, Moses summoned Joshua and said to him, Be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them, and you must divide it among them as their inheritance. 
The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Um, these verses for me, I think, are really encouraging just because God's saying that he's, he's been there. He's done it. He's going to always be with us. He goes before us. He's with us. Um, really got a lot of personal encouragement. And I think it's really encouraging for Hillside in the, in the time that we're in right now um, as we seek to call a, a new pastor and everything. That, that God's going to be with us. So it's a little bit about myself. If you have any more questions or want to get to know me, I'm here, and I'd love to talk to you. Uh, we're, we're always around. I live two minutes from here, so I'm here frequently. Um, and then, so we're going to move on. Just a couple announcements. I know uh, Greg talked about some announcements, but just what I want to point out. Um, Monday, May 15th, Dr. Ryan Nielsen's coming back to give us the results of his assessment. It's going to be uh, May 15th at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary, so I think it's going to be really impactful. The, the council has already talked to Dr. Nielsen a couple times and gotten his results. Uh, it's been very eye-opening, uh, and I think it's going to be a very rewarding experience for everyone, so I encourage you to be here. And then May 21st after church is going to be our annual meeting, uh, so please try to attend that. There will be child care provided. Big shout-out to Sabrina for taking care of that. So there will be food and child care, so you don't have any more excuses. You can be here. Uh, and that's the analysis. If you want to know anything else, go to the Welcome Center in the back, and Ruth will be happy to get you plugged in if you're looking to do that. So why don't we rise, stand up real quick for the benediction today. It's from 2 Peter chapter 1. It says, Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord.
God bless you, church. Have a wonderful day. You're dismissed. Go with that, that message that we have victory in Jesus. Scott keeps talking. We got a scarf. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm trying to figure out like who, who else wants to go because when Brad is here, yeah, he all the connections. He'd be like, all right, let's get this one. Let's get this one. So yeah, if you want to come with, that would be great. I think so far I've been working. So, like, okay. You guys been able to do it. What days typically work for you? I do Okay. I do Wednesdays or Thursdays. Whatever, whatever works for you. Okay, okay. great. Yeah, that would be great. So, See you later.